Hi, everybody. We're coming into the final stretch here. Appreciate you showing up. Um, hi, so we're going to talk about Kubernetes upgrades today in various parts. Uh, first part, I'm going to make a pretty concerted effort to convince you that you should want to upgrade frequently, even if you don't think you do, uh, and explain why I think that's really important. Uh, and then we're going to go into how to do that uh, safely today and where we're going in the future. Uh, so for introduction, I'm Jago McLeod. I lead open source Kubernetes at Google, uh, and I work on GKE, especially in the upgrades space and also in the node area. Uh, so whenever customers have challenges, uh, I end up talking to those customers. If you're some of those customers, thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here. Uh, all right, we're going to see if this works. Look at that. It's amazing. Uh, okay, so this uh, envelope, this shape is amazing to me. Uh, we used it a long time ago in a scalability talk um, to talk about how challenging it is to scale Kubernetes and how if you go up in one dimension, you have to go down in another. Um, part of the complexity in upgrades is that everything is expanding in every dimension. I talked about running uh, Kubernetes 65,000 node clusters today, and we also run on two nodes in retail environments. Uh, Linux does similar scaling, but they don't run the same binaries in both of those locations. Uh, so it's pretty interesting, uh, and my ultimate fear is that we end up like a spork where it's kind of like a combination spoon fork, and it doesn't really do anything very well. Uh, and so this is my ultimate fear. So we have to be really careful. Uh, Kubernetes has some advantages. It's modular. It has an extensible API. There are some benefits uh, that make this not an unwinnable battle, but it's something we have to focus on to do well. So critically, counterintuitively, slowing down is counterproductive. Uh, this is like riding a bike. Uh, you're scared to ride a bike, you slow down, you will tip over, you will skin your knee. Uh, it is, takes some getting used to, especially if you're coming from a more legacy system where your upgrades or migrations are move it to the new version, spend months or years fiddling with things. Hopefully you avoided the might as well project from hell where you might as well do this and that and the other thing while you're upgrading and migrating. Then you get everything just right, and then nobody touched anything. Um, this is not that world. And so we're going to walk through why. We have a core value at Google, which is no haunted graveyards. If you are scared to touch a thing, don't ignore it. That thing will come and get you. Make that thing your daily path to work or to school, or just walk through that thing every day until it's no longer scary. This is a core concept. So if upgrades bit you before, don't just put it off. It actually makes it much, much worse. So with that, we're going to get into some of the complexity. The challenge in holding on to releases longer is not the Kubernetes bits and the bits that we control as a community. It's that there are these transitive dependencies that go forever at layers of an onion, and every layer there's tiers or roots that branch and branch and branch and branch. Uh, I will share with you just a peek at some of that complexity. This is an actual graph generated from the Kubernetes source code that shows the transitive dependencies that I'm talking about. Like, I had to zoom in on the Kubernetes bit here so you can see how it ties to some other things. Um, you look through that and you will, your eyebrows will go up significantly. So what happens? There's a security vulnerability in one of those things. At every moment of every day, all year round. So something somewhere is always changing. It's not necessarily a thing that we as a Kubernetes community did. It's something that we depend on. And so that's challenging on its own. But wait, there's more. This is Containerd. It has its own ecosystem of components and things that are involved. 
This is the container runtime that we use to run the containers. Okay, so maybe something in there gets interesting. Uh, we have a, an interesting moment of moving from container D1.7 to 2.0, which came out last week. Congratulations to the container D community. Um, but these kinds of migrations are, require a lot of care. And that's not all. So if you look at the operating system, this is for cause. Cause is open source. You can look at the source on GitHub also. Um, but if you look at the dependency graph there, it just goes on and on and on. And then, of course, down below that, there's a kernel. And the kernel is a whole interesting world unto itself. I don't know if any of you came from that world. I did not, but I've learned more than I would like to. Um, and it is a little bit terrifying on its own. Okay, so we've got all these layers, we've got all this stuff, and then my favorite slide. We show this as like a victory slide. This is terrifying to me. How do you walk up to this landscape.cncf.io? Go check it out. I don't even know what a lot of these icons are, and I do this for a living for like a decade. I, uh, uh, how do you know if you are an end user and you start today, what do you need? What obviates the need for something else? And then all of those things have to work on versions of Kubernetes. So this is where the next part of the story gets interesting. So like, what if you just don't? What if you just go back to that mentality? Okay, like, let's just not upgrade. We get everything just right, it's containerized, it's like we get bin packing, we get some efficiency, it's pretty awesome. And now there's LTS at all the hyperscalers. What if we just stay on the same version? Okay, what does LTS actually get you? It gets you a one-time temporary reprieve. Then you shuffle to the back of the LTS window, and now you have to upgrade every four months, exactly like you did before. So you are in a strictly worse place than had you just upgraded every four months. This is a critical concept. So you're basically being a horrible person to your future self. Be kind to your future self. It's really important. So it's not actually a long-term solution. And I acknowledge that some companies have temporary moment, like you just need to upgrade once a year, so you need some buffer. It's okay if it's part of an upgrade strategy. It's not a long-term strategy to just shuffle to the end of the now extended support window and wait to be upgraded back then. It's just not a good idea. Why not? So I put down a few reasons to upgrade. I hope this is useful to all of you in your own organizations when you're trying to make the case that, no, we really need to figure this out. This is not the world we came from. This is not get everything right and just don't touch anything. This is the haunted graveyard you have to walk through. Um, and you'll notice on my first page, I, I came up with seven reasons because of Kubernetes and the number seven is very important. Um, but you'll notice on my first page, uh, features are not even in there. It's not about new features faster. Security is a critical one. Uh, and security is interesting because we're reducing the number of lines of code in Kubernetes with every release. This is like uh, we're desperately trying to reduce dependencies, reduce complexity, and reduce lines of code. And so that on its own reduces the, the attack surface, which makes it more secure. So it's not, I'm not talking about CVE patches. Those we may back for but the reduction in complexity, we don't. Stability. Uh, we just know how newer versions work better, and I'll talk about this a little more later. Um, but we just fix bugs. Like, we, we get bugs reported from older versions, and we, by accident, fix that bug by fixing something else, un completely unrelated, and it doesn't even exist in the newer version. So it's really interesting, the bugs that get discovered in later versions, the life cycle of those. The mean time to resolution is another interesting one. When our engineers get called for a support ticket and they're asked to root cause, what is this issue? They like literally don't remember how it worked two years ago. So they have to not just switch what branch they're working on in the source code, they have to like mentally time shift back to that moment and try and figure out how did this work, oh, that we didn't have that then, we had this version of that API, and it just takes longer. 
And the really tricky bugs, we end up not fixing within one sub-team in GKE. I'm sure this is true elsewhere, too. But then it gets bounced to another team, and then another team. And every team that has to interact with it has to go through that mental boot up out of cold storage. What was this again? Uh, OK. Uh, and then risk. And risk is in many multiple dimensions. But we'll uh, focus on one aspect, which is this compounding interest thing. Like the longer you wait to upgrade, the more change there is from where you are to the current version. And just like your bank account, compounding interest works in the reverse way as well. So this is super important. I think I talked about the complexity reduction, uh, so we'll skip over that one. But the newer versions are, I said often, I think always at this point, less complex. Like we're spending a lot of effort on this. And expertise is my last non-feature one, which is you learn by doing this, by upgrading. Every time you go through this process, you gain an intuition that you didn't have before. You gain a little bit of paranoia about the things that you shouldn't touch, uh, and you can't really tr tell someone to that paranoia. Like, you carry a pager, you can't unlearn that. You start to think two and three steps into the future, um, and you'll bring that back to your own team and share it. So features is the last reason. I think it is important. Sometimes there are features that your application depends on or make it more efficient. But there are almost always workarounds that cr creative people come up with to stop gap. So you can usually find a different way to solve the problem you have rather than upgrading. There are some exceptions, but that's truer as we go through time. So I want to talk about fragmentation. This is kind of crappy data, uh, it's data, for, um, not, uh, it's the Kubernetes clusters that were exposed to the public internet and the version endpoint was exposed. It went away a few releases ago, so it's a little bit dated. But the point of this, uh, and we have similar graphs in GKE and elsewhere that show that they're the long tail, the right end of this graph, you see like 122 just sort of plateaus, right? Those are the ones where people just leave it there and don't touch it. 121 kind of approaches, it's asymptotic, right? So the, the challenge with this is fragmentation, and it's the fragmentation from the ecosystem perspective. You probably don't only depend on Kubernetes itself, but also projects from other areas. Gateway API is an example. Um, Rob had a talk about Gateway API and upgrades earlier today from this perspective. So. The darker the lines, the more attention the engineers are putting on testing and integration and evolving. Uh, and so the most recent three, four releases here, this sort of question mark is the one that's about to be released. Maybe it has a name. I don't know if it has a name yet. Um, but these cute icons are the release icons from the last several uh, releases. And so Gateway API. They're evolving and they're iterating and they're using new features and CRDs and versioning and all this great stuff. Um, but they have to maintain backwards compatibility. They have one version of Gateway API that has to maintain backwards compatibility to all these versions of Kubernetes with all of their transitive dependencies that we remember. And as time goes on, how we worked and how we remember and how did we do that back then? I don't really remember. So when we talk about extending support for a version of Kubernetes many years into the past, it's not just Kubernetes itself, and it's not just what's underneath it. It's also what's built on top. And so this fragmentation actually is a risk to the ecosystem as a whole. The, not every project is super well funded to go back into eternity and so on. So this is another interesting aspect that's often overlooked. Okay, so hopefully I've kind of convinced you that this is something that you should focus on, that you should be doing. Um, and it's like, okay, uh, so but how? How do we do this without breaking our workloads? And that's the key. It's really about the workloads that are running on top of Kubernetes, um, not Kubernetes itself. Uh, so we're working super hard as a community to make this less of a problem, and I'm encouraging you all to skate to where the puck is going and not where the puck has been. So there were some pretty bad 
uh, upgrade the deprecated APIs and so on. It was like, what, 123? To like, I don't know. There's horror stories. Yeah, David covering his eyes. Uh, the next upgrades are not that. Right? We've been working, we now have GA AP, stable APIs. There's backwards compatibility guarantees. We're like much better than we were. So if you're on one of those older versions and you're scared to upgrade, it's gotten much better. Version emulation or compatibility mode is how I think I, I really want to consider this problem. So you separate the binary upgrade from the API upgrade. This is not a revolutionary concept in software engineering. It's just we haven't quite gotten there in Kubernetes. Uh, one thing that makes difficult is rolling back. And I feel kind of personally guilty that you can upgrade Kubernetes clusters and not roll back. Like, that just is a terrible place to be. Uh, faster cars start with better brakes, and we have to get better at that. And so we're working on that right now, compatibility modes and the ability to separate the binary from the API version. That's like a critical concept that we're working on. Uh, and then tech debt reduction in every dimension. I talked about reducing the complexity, the lines of code. Um, this just makes it simpler for us and better to see when we're about to make a mistake. Okay, so moving on to how do we actually do this? Virtually everyone running Kubernetes in production has more than one cluster. You have several clusters, um, and progressive rollout is kind of the key to the whole idea. So we have release channels in GKE. You opt into a release channel based on your risk tolerance, and you essentially you receive updates. Like you think about it as being subscribed to a release channel. You're not moving the cluster, you're receiving updates that are coming towards you over time. So if you think about uh, 132, we just had code freeze, we're like working on getting that release out by the end of the year. Um, that one will be coming soon. Then you have your dev cluster that your engineers are working against every day. Uh, and they're in the rapid release channel or on the newest version that's you know, actually available. Maybe not the dot zero, maybe not the dot one. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but the newer, minor version that's available. Uh, engineers are not shy about standing up when something goes wrong. So if their application stops working for some reason based on what version of Kubernetes they're running on, um, they stand up. I call this the prairie dog effect. You upgrade the clusters. Someone stands up, and you're like, oops, OK, uh, we found it. That's much better than doing that in production. Then you have a staging environment, integration environment, whatever you call it. You can kind of have that be behind your dev environment. And then, likely, you have several production clusters. Uh, most organizations have kind of multiple clusters in production, and some of them are more important than others for some reason. Either you have what we call a multi-single tenant architecture where each tenant gets their own cluster, and you have your whales, and you really can't break those. And then you have some others where maybe they're multi-tenant, or they're not quite as, they're not your whales, they're like, I don't know, the long tail. Uh, and those are a little bit more risk tolerance for those. Uh, so put those earlier in your progressive rollout. Give it a day to uh, see if anything went wrong. Uh, and really what this is about is we have lots of automated testing. It's really wonderful. We work really hard on it. Uh, and yet, we run other people's code, meaning end users' code, on other people's code, which is the Kubernetes community, often in other people's environments, like on someone else's hardware. And then we guarantee that it works well. This is a non-deterministic system, so we trip some threshold. What order do the static containers on the control plane come up? Uh, it depends. It's declarative. It's really wonderful. You just tell it the way it's supposed to be, and then who knows? So something super important might not load when it was supposed to. Uh, so your applications running on Kubernetes make assumptions. And it's really important to have this sort of canary and progressive rollout idea. So production end, say that's your, your whale, is at the end of that rolling. But make sure it keeps moving. It's not just the minor upgrades. It's also the patch upgrades and, and so on. So this is the, the sort of timeline, time extending from right to left. This is from the Google Cloud documentation for GKE. Uh, and 
So, or sorry, time extending from left to right. Um, so we put a new version in the rapid channel. And we have an, a concept of soak time. So it's cluster days. A cluster running for a day is a cluster day, and then we have thresholds at which it gets promoted across our release channels. This is a super useful mechanism. Whether you use GKE or not, uh, you can actually observe when GKE promotes from one channel to another, and we make it available, and then we make it default for new clusters, and then we make it an upgrade target. And each of those is a different level and a different level of confidence in a version. So it kind of comes out in the rapid channel, then it goes into uh, standard support for 14 months, and then you can opt into the extended channel for an additional 10 months. Now, we talked about some exceptions. There are some or add-ons, extension, community projects that don't test back then because it's not supported by the open source community. So some of that, you know, likely you're not adding new extensions and, add, and uh, community projects to an older cluster, but it's something to keep in mind. This is an idealized view of that soak time concept. So we put a new version in and sort of accumulate some soak time. Maybe we find a bug in it. It's kind of not that great. Um, then we ramp that down and we introduce a new version, and maybe that gets enough soak time in the rapid release channel. Uh, and all of this is essentially an extension. It, we have a hypothesis after our automated testing that a version is good. We put that into the world and we see is that hypothesis, do we validate or invalidate that hypothesis based on actual real world feedback? And this is super powerful. This is really important. And eventually, a version gets into the regular release channel. You get a whole lot more clusters on it. And then the next version comes out. And we do the same thing again. And then we put it into the regular release channel. It becomes the default. And it sort of uh, replaces the previous minor version. So this is an idealized view of this. But it, the, the actual graph doesn't look very different from this. Maybe there, there are a lot more uh, than this would suggest. Uh, because there are lots of independently versioned components. And this whole idea is uh, based on getting validation from real world observation that our hypothesis is true or not. So you can see kind of our idea behind release channels and which uh, is appropriate for you depends on your own risk tolerance and how eagerly you need to uh, absorb patch releases. Now, FedRAMP compliance is a really interesting uh, aspect here. Uh, FedRAMP requires that a company apply CVE patches within 30 days of learning that they exist. Uh, and so in our regular release channel, we would like to accumulate more than, say, 30 days. Well, and that 30 days includes us getting the version to become available. So really, you have maybe a week or two to do it. So more risk averse customers would prefer to have the most soaked versions, but if those patch releases come out, they have to be applied frequently. Uh, so we're always trying to tweak our approach so that you can be in the regular release channel but still get uh, aggressive patch releases. Um, but we'll, we approach, let me know if you have questions about FedRAMP compliance because that's a tricky topic. So I mentioned that even if you don't use GKE, you can still get value out of these concepts. Um, and you can actually subscribe to the RSS feed um, that we'll share with you when we make a new version uh, available uh, or the auto upgrade target. Uh, and so even if you're running on-prem in another cloud, you can subscribe to that. You can see and take that as a signal of our confidence in that version. Um, and of course, the later in our life cycle that is, the more engine hours that's had on it, the more soak time, and the stranger the bugs become. Um, there are still bugs later, but they're like really weird edge cases and really interesting, sometimes at super high scale or in really interesting network configurations, stuff that we didn't see coming. So they still happen occasionally, but much less frequently. And then you can, of course, subscribe to cluster notifications. You can plug these things into Slack um, so that you know. Um, you can set up all kinds of 
automation based on these signals. But the signals are really important. Okay, so now you know when to upgrade. And what you want to do then is instrument everything, progressively roll out slowly. This is actually not final thoughts. This is a copied slide because I'm going to say these at, at the end, so hang on just a minute. Um, but you got to separate the upgrades into layers where possible. When I'm talking about layers here, I'm talking about the Kubernetes cluster and then there may be extensions on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there might be applications that you as a platform team roll out to all of your end users, I don't know, Redis or Kafka or something that everybody uses. And then there's the end user applications. And if everyone upgrades all at the same time, it can be really hard to track down who did what at what point. The gold standard is a shared event stream using something like PubSub. Uh, where everyone feeds into the same event stream so that you can correlate some drop in health with an event that happened. Um, but if you can't do that, then at least separating into layers uh, is a useful aspect. And this whole concept of canaries and then waves and progressive rollout applies at every layer. I don't have this. I wanted to go back to this idea. Um, this idea, I think, is, from my perspective, the existential risk to the Kubernetes project as a whole. Fragmentation has plagued the Android community for years, and it's something that can really, truly create a weight that we may not be able to get out of. And we have LTS versions right now across all the public scale uh, hyperscalers and some of the on-prem and, and uh, other distributions. And this is a useful one-time bridge loan, but really pay it off, like really create an upgrade strategy that works for your company. Um, and train others around you how to do it so that you too can go on vacation. I think that's really important. So you can keep coming to KubeCon and be away from your terminal. Uh, I think more customers I speak with, there's one person that knows how it works and it's super brittle and it's very scary. So uh, we have an enormous amount of innovation going into Kubernetes right now. Last week was bananas and like, by bananas, I mean super exciting. There was all kinds of features going into, especially the node side. It's all about how to evolve Kubernetes to meet the needs of this next round of workloads. Primarily, uh, AI, ML workloads, they're really weird from a Kubernetes perspective. There's like enormous clusters with one pod per node, and that you can't take it down because the whole job has to stop. There was a keynote on Wednesday when the victory was we detected that the, the node died, and within six minutes, we were able to replace the node and restart the job. That was like heartbreaking to me. Like that's, that's not the bar. We should be able to keep the job running even though the node died. That's the critical part. Uh, and so we're really working hard to evolve Kubernetes to meet the needs of these new workloads. Uh, and I would expect that each of your organizations will want access to some of these Gen AI functionality and you'll only get it if you can keep your clusters kind of up to date over time. So that aspect is really critical, and the ecosystem, bringing the ecosystem along. Many of these projects are in their fourth or fifth or sixth year, uh, and they just don't have enough people to maintain backwards compatibility forever. So that's my closing thought. Uh, I'd love to have some question and answer. I think we have about five minutes for that, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time. What are your thoughts on blue-green deployment of clusters? Um, I think blue-green deployment of clusters uh, is a wonderful concept. It means dramatically different thing to dramatically different people. Um, I think in a cloud environment where you have infinite elasticity or 
more elasticity, if you can create an entirely new cluster and migrate workloads to it, um, that's a great place to be. Uh, most folks that I talk to are not there yet. Uh, so I'm a big fan. I think we also have blue-green kind of upgrades of node pools or like create new nodes at a new version and migrate workloads to it through a combination of auto-scaling and shifting traffic. Um, that's a variant on the blue-green upgrade that's pretty cool too. Um, so I'm a big fan. As long as it gets you over the hump, if that's the strategy that works for your organization, I think that's great. Yeah, hello. My question is um, coming back to the problem of fragmentation and see how it's a huge issue also for you um, because you need to keep spending resources on making backward compatibility. And for you, it's also a desirable situation to get your customers up to the latest versions, right? That's, that's, um, that's logic. Um, I know features are a good incentive, um, but the risk of uh, not being up to date and, get, and, and the benefits of having features is something that most of the time concerns two engineers. And when you work like in federated, in federated uh, organizations or in startups, sometimes you need to use money to convince people to allocate resource. So have you had any talk, um, have you heard about anything inside a GKE where you could do like a financial incentive for people being in the in the latest versions, like for instance, decrease like the per cluster price or something like that. I, I'm a customer, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the thought. I think the the idea is, can you use financial incentives to drive the behavior? Um, we kind of do in reverse, but it's not. I mean, I think all the hyperscalers charge about the same amount for extended support, uh, which is like uh, 60 cents a cluster instead of 10 cents a cluster um, hour. It's not enough, uh, and because of discounts and other ways, like it just it, it doesn't actually drive the right behavior, uh, and that the additional cost of Kubernetes on top of the compute, networking, and storage is is negligible from their perspective. Yeah, yeah. So you can't cut the price enough to make a difference. Is, uh, that's what I've seen anyway. Okay. If you have other ideas, I'd love to hear. Them. <laughs> I just was wondering. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, you mentioned control plane rollback. Uh, is there a cap for a working group in the community talking about that, or where could, where could we get more involved? Yeah, come talk to these people right here. The okay. SIG API machinery is up here. Um, we do need uh, an effort in SIG node as well for compatibility modes in node so that they can emulate an older API as well. Um, but I'm super keen on this way to solve the problem that, these, that customers are having. My, my, my ultimate dream is that 1.x is the LTS and that the minor versions are not a new major upgrade. We actually keep that. That's the way to continue uh, to support older applications that are depending on an older API. I, I mean, again, this is not like new or rocket science, like separating the binary upgrade from the API upgrade. The, these are just things that are that we, we, we knew we didn't do earlier on, uh, and it's hard to do now, but, uh, but it's not impossible, and we are actually doing it, so. I just signed you up, guys. I hope that's okay. That's okay. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, my question is more uh, from the release perspective. You mentioned there are a lot of components which uh, you know depend on how you release. Um, there was a diagram like which basically shows so many icons, right? So um, you spoke about containerity also, and so I, I want to understand from uh, your from uh, the perspective of what you do, what components do you make sure is compatible, uh, except the Kubernetes itself. Um, so. Uh, definitely, Kubernetes is there, and the uh, interfaces are there. But then, apart from that, are there any major components that you do the testing with? Um, the, uh, the things that are direct dependencies of Kubernetes, we do test as part of the Kubernetes community, like the, their acceptance tests and conformance tests and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, so that includes containerity, or what other runtimes does that include? Like, uh, I'm just. Uh, 
Uh, so like etcd is a good example of et etcd. etcd oh, um, okay. It doesn't work and we don't create. Uh, it's important to note that the Kubernetes community provides about 14 months of support. Mm -hmm. um, and so beyond that, it's actually on the vendor who's providing an extended support. Uh, and so it's on them. So it depends on who's doing that work. Um, but the communities we work really closely with, like there's a SIG etcd now from the Kubernetes community because it's such a core dependency. Um, and the Go programming language, we work with the Go team pretty closely. Yeah. Um, and the compatibility mode thing actually started with them. We wanted them to extend support for a version. And they said, what if we didn't, but we let you use that? Uh, and so that, that's a really close partnership and a pretty cool outcome from that conversation too. And, and how often do you, um, so once upstream Kubernetes has released new version, how often do you take that on uh, GK? Like, what's the wait period? It's like a week. I mean, it's like days oh. at this point. Wow, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Yeah, yeah it's good. really good. Like, I'm, I'm hoping we get the alpha or beta build live on GK one day. Yeah, okay. Jor Jordan's laughing because that's the. Cool, good luck, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I just have a question about the general practice. Uh, so, would you recommend us because Kubernetes have a control plane and a, uh, many add-ons? So, would you recommend uh, the cluster operator to upgrade everything at the bundle from one environment all the way to other environment, or we just break it down to different, uh, you know, mod, uh, microservice and uh, upgrade them independently, which could have a better agility, but. Uh, yeah, I just want to hear from you, which would you recommend? Uh, let me catch you afterward. I, it's really hard to hear right now, so let me catch you after, and we can just talk face to face. Like, sure. It's like Thank a little you. tricky, but d don't leave. Give me one minute after. Uh, maybe last question, and then yeah. we should call it. Yeah, hi. Uh, as a disclaimer, we are on EKS. I think probably the same uh, issue with GKE. So we have uh, many clusters but uh, with the many nodes, like hundreds of nodes in total. So uh, upgrading control plane is uh, okay, but upgrading the nodes is kind of a pain point. So is there any best practice doing that, like transferring the workloads on new node, and it takes a while, and you know, it's not a very pleasant experience. <laughs> uh, I, let me catch you afterward, too. It's okay. hard to have a conversation like this. So let's call it. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day.